Thomas and Philip, Gospels of the Gnostic Christ. And uh, now uh, we'll uh, wrap up our little series on uh, the Naj Hammadi Library and uh, its content this evening uh, by dealing with uh, the main works particularly that we find in the Naj Hammadi collection uh, of uh, Gnostic soteriology or the Gnostic teachings uh, concerning the Savior, uh, in this case the figure of Jesus. But uh, before we go specifically to the uh, uh, four principal works in the Naj Hammadi collection, which are called Gospels, only these four are bear in their title the name Gospel, um, uh, although often sort of generically the whole Naj Hammadi collection is um, uh, called the Gnostic Gospels, as Elin Pagels called them in her book, but there are only four works there, which are uh, the Gospel according to Thomas, uh, the Gospel of Truth, the Gospel of the Egyptians, and the Gospel of Philip and uh, more about that a little bit later. Um, however, uh, it may be useful also to uh, uh, mention right away that the uh, term gospel in Greek, evangelion, um, uh, did not mean in uh, biblical times um, what it has come to uh, be associated with primarily uh, nowadays or in the later periods, uh, because if we uh, think of the um, four uh, canonical gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, um, we find, of course, in each one of these um, uh, a narrative uh, of uh, the life of Jesus, and then interspersed with the narrative we have various uh, uh, sayings that are attributed to Jesus. Uh, the uh, Naj Hammadi Gospels do not contain that kind of a narrative. Uh, the Gospel according to Thomas, which is the best known scripture bar none probably from the Naj Hammadi collection, uh, contains sayings of Jesus and nothing else. Uh, it uh, has a tiny little introductory uh, portion. These are the words which the living Jesus spoke and Didymus Judas Thomas wrote. He who will understand the meaning of these words will not taste death. And then there come one after the other um, the uh, sayings, uh, 117 or something of that sort, if I'm not mistaken, but I could easily be mistaken, um, uh, sayings of Jesus usually introduced with the words Jesus said. Uh, so it is a, a straight collection of uh, uh, aphorisms or sayings of uh, Jesus. Uh, the others, the Gospel of Truth, has been described uh, fairly well, I think, uh, fairly accurately as a, uh, a meditation uh, on the uh, meaning of the mission of Jesus, a meditation on the work of salvation, a meditation on the, uh, the uh, coming and the activities of uh, the Gnostic uh, Savior. Uh, so there is no uh, uh, narrative in that sense present there either. The Gospel of um, Philip contains sayings, uh, some of which are undoubtedly attributed to Jesus, and others are probably uh, commentaries by various Gnostic authors, the entire scripture having been uh, apparently collected and put down by the Apostle Philip. Um, the um, Gospel of Philip uh, has been uh, called uh, a, um, a Gnostic work of sacramental theology because it deals primarily with um, the mysteries or sacraments instituted uh, by Jesus and their um, um, role within the Gnostic uh, process of salvation. The principal emphasis in the Gospel of Philip is on a sacrament or mystery which has been lost uh, in later times, undoubtedly lost on purpose uh, uh, by the um, uh, so-called uh, Orthodox non-Gnostic Church that took over um, after the um, takeover really of the Christian Church by the Emperor Constantine, namely the mystery of the bride chamber uh, and the various other sacramental mysteries that constellate themselves around that. The Gospel of the Egyptians, on the other hand, is also um, uh, to a major extent a sacramental work and it appears to uh, contain primarily uh, the text of an initiation ritual. Uh, which apparently was used by the Egyptian Gnostics. So this is in briefest outline form the characterization of the four scriptures that bear the title Gospel in the Nachamadi collection. Now, Gospel really means only in the original Greek a um, happy message, uh, and uh, it was a term often attributed to um, messages coming from an important source. Even some of the uh, um, sort of general pronouncements that the Roman emperors would uh, sent out to their uh, subjects, informing their subjects of various matters, were often called Evangelia, um, or Gospels. So um, uh, the modern as the later association with the term Gospel as having to be specifically something uh, that describes the uh, life and activities of uh, Jesus was certainly did not obtain in ancient times. So the meaning was sort of, well, you know, a happy message. Right? The emperor sends out a message here. Here is good news, gospel. Happy news, your taxes are going to be raised, or something of that sort. Uh, nowadays, of course, the government uses the television screen and other methods to bring similarly disturbing good news to our attention. Mm. 
Now, uh, what we may need to look at before um, going into uh, some detail and regarding these uh, four scriptures and their content um, is really the uh, entire uh, context of um, uh, the meaning of the Gnostic Savior and the meaning and the need for salvation uh, as understood by uh, the Gnostics, uh, in as much as that understanding differs significantly from um, the uh, understanding that uh, prevails generally in uh, mainstream uh, Christendom. Mainstream Christendom, as it developed uh, since the early uh, apostolic uh, period, has come to uh, associate the idea of salvation primarily with sin. So uh, the uh, concept of sin, both original and personal, um, is most intimately and inexorably connected with the notion of salvation. The orthodox, so-called orthodox Christian uh, statement is to the effect that um, uh, ever since the time of their creation and ever since the uh, bizarre story of uh, the Garden of Eden and the events that are said to have transpired there, humankind was guilty of sin. Uh, and as the first uh, human pair has uh, become sinful, um, being disobedient to the Creator concerning the whole curious story of a fruit and the tree and the talking snake and uh, all these sorts of things that you may recall, uh, well, uh, the human race itself came to be uh, afflicted by a condition that theologians call the original sin. This means, of course, that uh, um, even if we uh, were not to commit any kind of an, uh, um, any kind of an act that contravenes um, commandments of one kind or the other, even if we were able to totally uh, abstain from such transgressions in the course of our lives, just by being born we are already afflicted by the weight of sin. This is the general concept of sin of uh, mainstream Christendom. And that is because of um, uh, such uh, original sin, um, no doubt uh, complicated by personal transgressions that God had to send his only begotten son and uh, had to in fact sacrifice his son on the cross so that this uh, weight of sin might be lifted from the shoulders of humanity. The uh, Gnostic notion, however, was appreciably different from that. You may recall from some earlier discussions, especially regarding the Gnostic version of the creation myth, that uh, Gnostics did not feel that um, the chief difficulty with our uh, lives, that the principal cause of our predicament uh, on this earth uh, was sin, uh, either the sin of our ancestors or our own. This is not to say that uh, Gnostics denied that we um, are prone to uh, doing things in a wrong way and of not doing things in the right way. Uh, because most anyone with the slightest degree of um, uh, sense about life and with some amount of self-reflection will of course recognize that, that we don't uh, do everything as we ought to, and that indeed we, uh, both by omission and by commission, um, miss the mark uh, of uh, goodness, of uh, perfection, and of uh, truly uh, correct behavior in our lives. And indeed the uh, Greek meaning again of the term uh, sin, um, that is the Greek word that translates as sin, hemartia, means exactly that, the missing of the mark. It is a term that is taken from the art of archery, uh, which no doubt was of extremely great importance at that time, since the dubious blessing of guns uh, of one kind or the other that uh, constitutes such a, uh, uh, an all-important element it would seem in our societies today was not present at that time. People used arrows in order to shoot. And so when we miss the mark in the archery, uh, we um, have failed, at least in that particular task. And similarly, it was understood that uh, uh, both uh, spiritually and morally, uh, people very frequently miss the mark in this life. Uh, however, this missing of the mark was not conceived by the Gnostics as uh, having uh, such momentous, indeed, uh, um, uh, cosmic uh, consequences, as uh, the uh, so-called Orthodox party uh, thought. Uh, the Gnostics felt that what, uh, uh, or let's say that they felt that the uh, complex uh, set of circumstances uh, within which we exist, and some of which indeed are present within us, which appear to keep us from being happy, from being wise, from being uh, skilled in the uh, art of living and of spiritual perception and of um, uh, morally commendable behavior, had other origins than our personal or collective sin. Indeed, the Gnostics felt that humans uh, were not truly uh, powerful enough, uh, important enough, uh, potent enough to uh, have caused such a momentous dislocation in the fabric of being um, that we uh, experience and whereby we are afflicted. And that therefore the, uh, uh, the essential askewness 
the, uh, uh, the wrongness of um, so many circumstances in this world uh, must have had more profound and powerful uh, origins and causes than the mere missing of the mark on the part of humans. And uh, so once again, as we point back to the Gnostic creation myth and so forth, we find that very, very early, even before the appearance of the human being on earth, so said the Gnostics, things started going wrong. And then we might say they uh, continued in that course pretty much to the present time. That there is an existential wrongfulness uh, that is present in uh, the fabric of being. Uh, and uh, um, this needs a remedy, but certainly um, uh, the uh, remedy must come from very high and very important sources. Uh, we might say that uh, even as the, uh, the ultimate causes of our uh, difficulties, uh, of the, uh, the perversities and, uh, and uh, evils that are present in this world and are, of course, affecting us and to a certain extent are also present within us, that um, even as these uh, circumstances um, uh, originated in the, in the course of the formation, in the course of the creation of um, this reality, so-called reality within which we live, uh, so the remedy must also come from a higher or a transcendental source. Uh, and that is why the teaching of uh, salvation, the teaching of the uh, remedying of these circumstances came about within a Gnostic context. Um, so uh, without going at this point into a great deal of detail, the Gnostic position always was that in the course of the universe and human beings and other uh, living creatures within the universe coming forth from uh, the invisible realms, various things went wrong, uh, and that now uh, we are caught within this uh, wrongfulness. We are imprisoned in a cell, in a prison house with the cells, uh, which are not of our own making and which our powers do not uh, really suffice to uh, extricate ourselves from. Uh, oh yes, we have to do our part. It is uh, extremely important for the Gnostic salvation for the individual to wake up and to uh, uh, acquire a more keen perception and insight um, into the situation within which um, uh, the human being finds himself. Without uh, such a, um, uh, the arising of such a greater consciousness, of um, such a deeper uh, self-reflection, and a deeper reflection over the, the existential condition uh, within which we uh, find ourselves, there can be no uh, salvation. Uh, so certainly the, um, the consciousness of the individual human being is of crucial importance. Uh, but this consciousness, so said the Gnostics, requires something that they call Gnosis, rather than mere faith and belief. The um, uh, later uh, self-styled Orthodox uh, Christian uh, feels that believing in the uh, figure and in the salvific work of uh, the Savior is the main ingredient. That if we only believe that there is a Savior, that he has done certain things for us, and that uh, particularly in evangelical Christianity, if we somehow inwardly accept uh, that fact, then we are saved. The Gnostic said that it is true enough that salvific agencies, not just one, although they certainly had a very high regard for Jesus as the last one, but salvific agencies have manifested in the world over and over again since the beginning. Uh, we are in a uh, dire predicament, but in that predicament we have not been uh, deserted. We have not been abandoned by the high and holy and wise and good source from whence we have come. And uh, so uh, repeated efforts have been made throughout history to uh, um, assist us in uh, recovering our original condition and in uh, getting away from all of these uh, unfortunate and horrific circumstances. We have never been without help. And so um, at certain times uh, throughout history there would be um, what can, can't probably be uh, described in any better terms but a descent the coming down of the uh, helpful agencies from above. Uh, so this is very important to keep in mind that in the Gnostic view, uh, the um, event of salvation or liberation um, is a joint effort, the conjoining of two efforts, the effort of the human to reach upward and outward from his condition of unconsciousness and darkness and misery, and the reaching down of the uh, divine uh, source toward the human. When these two conjoin with each other, when this conjunctio, conjunction, as the alchemists might have called it, occur, then there is salvation or liberation. So the two extremes which tend to uh, appear in human thought regarding these matters are both incorrect. On the one hand, this work 
even though it's a work that we also must undertake, is not uh, totally a, um, well, what some years ago used to be called in, in ordinary departments a do-it-yourself project. You know, people in our country have always been given to um, do-it-yourself projects. Mr. Manley Hall, of blessed memory, who every year at the beginning of the year, in early January, would give some talks on the, the, from an astrological point of view about what would happen throughout the year, uh, in his um, talk on the various signs of the zodiac, would always say, this year, again, like in all previous years, many people are going to suffer uh, painful and unfortunate accidents as a result of do-it-yourself projects in the home. And he advised people to uh, uh, resort to uh, uh, professionals, uh, to uh, tradespeople who uh, knew how to do things, and that while thereby perhaps uh, one might suffer from the flattening of one's wallet, a uh, regrettable health condition that we all suffer from, uh, but at least we wouldn't be hurt while we are trying to fix things in our house. So, um, uh, you know, we are, um, uh, we are, we are given to do-it-yourself projects. Uh, but... Um, um, Solving this great problem, getting out of this predicament, cannot be a totally a do-it-yourself project. Uh, would that be the case if it were such? The chances are that all of us, or at least many of us, would have already extricated ourselves from this situation. Because certainly uh, uh, people have been giving uh, thought and effort to these problems since the world began. As no, no sooner do people come into the world, such as little babies and so forth, and they look around and immediately they, they begin to cry, which to me always has been a clear indication that they are not terribly happy with the circumstances into which they have come. In fact, looking at little babies crying, I often get the feeling that what they are saying is, oh no, not this place again, uh, which, is, uh, which, uh, which of course when conjoined with the possibility of reincarnation would certainly make some sense. So the, the Gnostic position was that we cannot do it entirely on our own. We do require help. And this help must of necessity be from outside. But one needs to be prepared for that help. There has to be an interior uh, readiness. There has to be perception that allows the individual to recognize the help when it comes and to properly take advantage of it. Now, this is really the essence, then we might say, of Gnostic soteriology. Uh, yes, help from outside, uh, uh, from outside the dark box wherein we live comes. But our eyes must be open and uh, our ears must be attuned to uh, the, uh, the, the helping effort, to the effort of uh, liberation or salvation. In various Gnostic scriptures, when we look through them, we find references that there were such helpful efforts forthcoming already in Old Testamentary times. One of the uh, uh, savior figures, messianic figures referred to from the Old Testament is the in Gnostic scriptures is the mysterious um, um, son uh, third son of Adam and Eve called Seth. You know, there is the well-known two sons being Cain and Abel, um, uh, who of course had a not terribly pleasant relationship with each other, uh, and uh, uh, have kind of set the, uh, the pattern for, uni for the workings of universal brotherhood forever after. Because um, when I ever hear this term of brotherhood, I always think, well, if the behavior of the first two brothers towards each other is an indication of brotherhood, well, then we are probably in very deep trouble, and uh, it would seem that indeed we are. Uh, but there is mentioned in uh, the Gnostic uh, scriptures a third son, Seth, who was the wise uh, son, and who became an enlightened Gnostic, and who became a, um, a helpful and a savior figure for that particular uh, time. And then uh, we are told that throughout history there were others. Some uh, Gnostic groups um, were even aware of um, the activities of a great uh, sage um, some 500 years or so prior to their time called the Buddha in India. And they uh, mentioned him and they recognized him as a great uh, salvific figure. Uh, the uh, outstanding uh, great prophet of one of the neighboring uh, countries and peoples of Persia, the prophet Zarathustra, is also mentioned in some Gnostic, primarily Manichaean scriptures, as having been a uh, great uh, helper, a salvific uh, figure for humanity. And then, of course, uh, came the messianic figure of Jesus, whom uh, the Gnostics recognized as the latest, and uh, in many ways perhaps the greatest, at least for their circumstances and for that time, for their time of a uh, savior figure. Now, um, as far as uh, one can discern from such sources as the Gospel according to Thomas and the Gospel of Truth and the others that I have mentioned, the Gnostics um, uh, were of the uh, view that uh, uh, Jesus um, helped, that Jesus um, enlightened and saved in two ways. Incidentally, um, uh, I know that many of us, including myself as I'm speaking, uh, have a sort of a little revulsion every time we use the term save 
and salvation. Uh, because uh, the whole concept of salvation has been subject to, I think, so much corruption and has become so uh, vulgarized by various people in Christendom that uh, I think most of us uh, get a little bit of a bad feeling when we hear that uh, word. Um, and uh, it's important to remember, here again, a little uh, knowledge of the languages uh, helps, that the, um, uh, the Greek term uh, soteria, which means, which is translated as salvation, uh, um, because in the Latin it is called salvatio, means quite literally healing, uh, making whole. And so the soter, the savior, is someone who makes whole, who heals some very grave condition. The kind of uh, very materialistic, what the Gnostics in the Greek terminology would have called heretic people, draw the conclusion from that that uh, the truly important thing about Jesus was that he healed people. Well, um, yes and no. Um, the Gnostic position was that the physical healings attributed to Jesus were um, uh, rather insignificant compared to the great spiritual healing work that he was performing. And that uh, the most important healing work is the, uh, the healing of our souls from the great wound of uh, existing in this frustrating, uh, mixed up, miserable world where we find ourselves. That we are all in need of healing in our interior being. No doubt from time to time we are also in need of external healing of, uh, with the uh, coming of age and its frailties I'm increasingly personally aware. Uh, and when you see me sort of uh, limping into the room here then perhaps you are also aware of it. Uh, but that's another matter again. As His Holiness the Dalai Lama said to a uh, man uh, not very long ago who uh, man who came to visit him who was suffering from the dread disease AIDS, um, uh, when the man mentioned this to Dalai Lama, the Dalai Lama said to him, oh yes, he says, the, the, body, the body is the chief seat of suffering in this world, the universal condition. But of course, uh, the cause of the total picture of the suffering is interior, it's in the soul, it's in the mind. And so that is where the healer, uh, the soter, performs his chief work. And uh, so um, salvation then is really, again, the, the undoing of some kind of a condition that medically might be called a pathology. You know, pathos in Greek means suffering. When we say someone is pathetic, that means he is suffering, he is deserving of pity because he is suffering. So um, uh, there is a, a, a pathology, there is a great sickness, and uh, it is from that sickness that we need to be healed. This is salvation. So it doesn't have to do with sin, it doesn't have to do with um, uh, any of the notions that are so prevalent in uh, Orthodox uh, Christendom, but rather it is the, the undoing of uh, something that is, is wrong with our uh, existence. Now, uh, this work of salvation, as far as the, the figure of Jesus is concerned, is uh, accomplished or facilitated in two primary ways. By way of uh, the teachings of uh, the Messiah. Uh, the Messiah is a teacher. He is a teacher of Gnosis. His teaching, his exhortation, um, awakens the consciousness of people. By way of the ideas, by way of the insights, by way of the, uh, the uh, deep uh, uh, realities uh, which he conveys and uh, to which he calls people's attention, he awakens their readiness for uh, internal liberation. Uh, so um, that is half of uh, the work. Uh, and that is probably one that uh, even most people in these uh, secularized uh, times uh, can relate to with some uh, degree of uh, acceptance. Because all of us have been helped to some degree or the other by the um, verbal exhortations of other people, whether we found them in the printed word or whether we um, found them by uh, listening to uh, someone or in uh, whatever way. We, uh, we know that we can receive a great deal of help in that uh, fashion. The other is perhaps a little more difficult to relate to, uh, primarily because in our um, uh, world, in more recent years and centuries, um, I think uh, here in our culture we have become alienated from this phenomenon. We are not very aware of it. And that is the phenomenon of mysteries. It is said, Jesus brought and performed liberating mysteries for the people who came to him. Um, uh, what are these mysteries? Well, one thing about mysteries is that they are mysterious. <laughs> uh, um, it, it, they are not easily described or uh, defined. But I think um, here again a little uh, sort of comparative uh, uh, study of religious and spiritual traditions uh, comes in handy. Uh, because uh, if we only uh, look... Uh, um, with an open eye, uh, to what other great re salvific religious traditions have done and are doing in the world, we find that they also um, um, practice both of these uh, modalities, let's say, of enlightenment and of liberation, one being the teaching, but the other one being the mystery, or mystery initiation, the passing on, the conveying of spiritual power, without words, without the filtering and thereby often distorting mechanism of the intellect, the passing on of uh, 
spiritual force to other people, which force then gives them the ability, the, the power to um, uh, continue on their path of liberation. If we look into what gurus in India, for instance, do uh, with disciples, we find that they don't just teach, although certainly they do teach. But in initiatory uh, procedures, they uh, empower spiritually people. Now, empowerment is another one of these terms which I think has been subject to a, a great deal of uh, vulgarization and similar flapdoodles in recent years. <laughs> um, it seems that uh, for the last few decades, everybody wants to be empowered and that the whole uh, idea of power has become one of these buzzwords. Well, give it a few more decades and there will be another buzzword uh, probably equally misunderstood as the notion of power and of empowerment. Uh, but just because um, certain concepts and terms are misused uh, does not mean that they don't have a legitimate use as well. In fact, before there is misuse or abuse, there is always correct use. If the correct use were not there, there couldn't be any misuse. Uh, so we always have to remember that and don't get totally turned off from this concept just because people are misusing them, overusing them, abusing them, and, and, and whatever else. And so it is very much... Uh, part of the universal wisdom of truly authentic spiritual traditions that there are activities that great uh, spiritual teachers initiate and which then uh, their successors, such as they may be, generally carry forward, which are not in the nature of teaching, pure and simple, which are not verbal, exhortative in nature, but which are um, rather in the nature of mystical empowerments, where a certain kind of uh, force, a certain kind of uh, uh, invisible energy uh, seems to be uh, passed on and consequently kindled uh, in us, and by way of this energy then various salutary changes can ta take place uh, within us. So it was the, the Gnostic position that Jesus performed both of uh, these, and that that is uh, how, let's say, the uh, salvific work took place. Now, uh, from our point of view, uh, we might also ask, um, was this a... a uh, novel uh, idea within the um, Mediterranean and particularly within the Jewish uh, context, were there developments that led up to this uh, or not? Uh, and of course, uh, even just ordinary historical study will teach us, and even the New Testament reveals that, that obviously um, uh, there uh, was a great deal of messianic expectancy taking place within the Jewish uh, context at that time. Uh, the uh, ancient Judaism had all sorts of uh, ways in which it distinguished important spiritual figures. It had prophets, um, which uh, doesn't exist uh, everywhere. Prophetic religiosity is a particular phenomenon which is largely connected with certain monotheistic religions. We can't really be sure whether it started with the Jews or whether perhaps it started with the Persians, uh, but certainly the, uh, the Persian, the Jewish, um, and ultimately the Islamic uh, matrix is the one that concentrates on the, um, on the role of prophecy. Now, the prophets are human beings who are chosen by the monotheistic God, to become the, uh, the mouthpieces of God. And so the prophets, when they speak, say, Thus saith the Lord. So the Jews had prophets. Twelve minor and four major prophets are distinguished in the Old Testament uh, study. The Jews also had a priesthood, hereditary priesthood. These were the people who um, took care of the great temple in Jerusalem, who performed uh, the sacrifices, and who ministered to the needs of the people in a ceremonial and sacramental uh, manner. Uh, and then, in addition to that, there was the concept of Messiahs, or Mashiach, uh, as it is called in, uh, in Hebrew. This literally means someone who is anointed. Uh, now, uh, yeah. anointing, again, was uh, a formal symbolic procedure uh, which still exists in many religious traditions and is primarily done with oil. Um, the uh, ancient kings of Israel, beginning with uh, King David, uh, uh, who was anointed by the prophet Samuel, uh, were, let's say, raised to their royal status as kings of Israel by having uh, sacramental oil poured on their head. And uh, if in a few places where there um, are still ancient ceremonies connected with kingship, especially in Christendom, such as, for instance, among the monarchs of England, when uh, Her uh, Majesty Queen Elizabeth was uh, crowned back in the early 1950s, um, uh, television was already available at that time. I remember uh, seeing the her coronation. An important part of the coronation was the anointing when the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury anoints, anointed the Queen with holy oil. Uh, but this is a symbol, a symbol of uh, spiritual authority, of spiritual force. And so the Messiah, the anointed, is anointed not just with oil, but is um, empowered uh, for a salvific mission by uh, deity. 
And of course, uh, in Jesus' time and in later times too, the Jewish people frequently interpreted, perhaps misinterpreted, the rule of the Messiah as being a political one. After all, they were the, uh, an occupied country, and people don't usually enjoy that. I've been in that position myself. Uh, all you can think of is how to get rid of these uh, no good people who are pushing him around, <laughs> and so forth. And so the Messiah was expected to be a political uh, Messiah. But uh, perhaps the symbol was not fully recognized at all times and was missed by the majority of the people, because um, the obvious symbolism is, which ask any rabbi today, they will tell you that, for instance, the, um, the captivity of the Jewish people in Egypt, as recounted in the book of Exodus, has always been regarded by uh, Jewish uh, theology as a symbol of the human condition. Uh, we are all in exile in Egypt, uh, and we are, we are all in need of being led out of the land of darkness and led to the promised land of our own place, our own spiritual home, call it heaven, the Gnostics would have called it the Pleroma, uh, where we truly belong. And that therefore we are in a condition uh, where we don't belong. Um, and the uh, messiahship, and the also the in interpreting the messiah as someone who would uh, save the Jewish people, for instance, for the Romans, is also an obvious symbol. We know now uh, very well, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls and much of the material that was discovered there, that there were certainly quite a lot of Jewish people present at that time, uh, many of whom uh, lived in these uh, esoteric communities on the shores of the Dead Sea, in Qumran and other places, the so-called Essenes, or therapeutes, or Zadokites, and various other names for them, who uh, fully understood that the notion of messiahship was a spiritual process and that it was from a, a, a spiritual enslavement, a, a spiritual um, occupation, that the Messiah was to save human beings, that this was a symbolic issue. Uh, in fact, there were different great figures in Jewish history and the past who were regarded as Messiahs, or at least as partial Messiahs. In, 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 uh, in the Talmud and elsewhere, King David is referred to as the Messiah, some others are. And of course, Jesus is also regarded as having a physical family lineage going back to David, because both his mother and father were somehow related to the old royal family of David, although they lived by then in, in, in humble circumstances. So here is the issue of uh, messiahship, uh, which then is lifted out of the original, um, you know, primarily Jewish context, and the, this person becomes a universal messiah. But it seems that uh, messiahship was, was expressing itself. There was a, what might be called, and C.G. Jung certainly interpreted it that way, that there was a, an archetypal impulse that was um, trying to come forth for quite a period of time, for maybe 150 years, maybe even 200 years prior to the time of Jesus. People, people appeared who, um, who uh, might have been messiahs. The, the, the impulse was sort of concentrating. And one of the great figures certainly right at the time of Jesus who, was sort of the, uh, who showed the archetype perhaps in a very powerful manner was John the Baptizer, who um, certainly had a connection with the figure of Jesus, also with some other uh, teachers. Two, uh, two important Gnostic teachers were disciples, if you see, of uh, John the Baptizer. One of them was um, Simon, uh, who often is called Simon the Magician, or Simon Magus, and the other one was Dositeus or Dostai, who um, was a teacher in what now would consider to be Arabia. Uh, in fact, uh, John himself was regarded as a messiah by his followers. And to this day, there is a um, Gnostic religious community that resides in all these many, all these 2,000 years, primarily in uh, what is now Iraq, Mesopotamia, and in parts of Persia, the so-called Mandians, who to this day regard John the Baptizer, and I say I don't like to call him Baptist, I don't like to associate him with the present day denomination, uh, John the Baptizer as their savior, as the principal savior. So the you know, messiahship was sort of congealing at the time. The, the salvific impulse was coming forth, and it, one might say that Jesus was perhaps one of several messianic figures, but he became the major one, he became the, um, the, most, the one with the, the most universal um, uh, impact uh, up, upon the people and upon history. But these were the two ways, the teaching and the mysteries which he conveyed, the mysteries and, and empowerments. Now, um, it is obvious that the Gnostic position then held that Jesus redeemed by his life rather than by his death. The uh, death by crucifixion, if indeed that uh, is the case, but uh, let's say the majority of the scriptures, uh, both Gnostic and canonical, seem to indicate that that was the case. Um, the death by crucifixion, the burial, and the subsequent resurrection were not considered of um, uh, such overwhelming major import as they came to be considered in conventional Christendom. In fact, uh, the Gnostics uh, sort of essentially um, uh, said that yes, these, these events occurred and they were very uh, sad and very uh, regrettable, but that was not his work. And therefore, somehow to think that the, uh, the work of redemption occurred by way of a death is not quite the right idea. Although, of course, the Gnostics fully recognized that um, here again a symbolic issue was present. Because when divinity comes to earth, it dies. <laughs> and so uh, the resurrection is the rising out of that spiritual death which uh, embodiment in the fleshly garment obviously uh, implies. So we might say the crucifixion of Jesus um, occurred when he was born, 
<laughs> and even before that, because um, the entry into a physical limitation is torment, is a crucifixion to the spirit. And this is also true of each and every one of us. So that entire process is not without meaning. It has a great spiritual meaning. And we find this, and I'm summarizing now you know, the, the statements that are present in the Gospel according to Thomas, in the Gospel of Truth, and many others. But to say that this physical event uh, was the one that had the momentous spiritual consequences is not right. This was the uh, position of the uh, Gnostics. Now, um, in the Gospel of Thomas, there is a particular uh, passage dealing with certain sayings of Jesus, the so-called 13th uh, Logion, which gives us a good Gnostic approach to who Jesus really was, from a Gnostic point of view, and what his work was. This is probably uh, the best. It is similar to, but not identical, with um, a passage that we find in the canonical gospel in the 16th chapter of the gospel of Matthew, 13th verse, uh, where we find a similar statement, but not quite of a Gnostic nature. Here is the, uh, the 13th logion of the gospel of Thomas. Jesus said to his disciples, Make a comparison to me, and tell me whom I am like. Simon Peter said to him, Thou art like a righteous angel. Matthew said to him, Thou art like a wise man of understanding. Thomas said to him, Master, my mouth will not at all be capable of saying whom thou art like. Yes. like. It is beyond me to express it, in other words. Jesus said to Thomas, I am not thy master, because thou hast drunk, thou hast become drunk from the bubbling spring which I have measured out. And he took him with him, he withdrew, he spoke three words to him. Now when Thomas came to his companions, they asked him, what did Jesus say to thee? Thomas said to them, if I tell you one of these words which he said to me, you will take up stones and throw them at me, and fire will come from the stones and burn you up. Uh, now, uh, the reason I said that this was a good Gnostic approach, or a good Gnostic uh, definition, uh, is because the entire method, the way, where it, how it is expressed, it bespeaks the nature of Gnosis. In the uh, canonical Gospel uh, of Matthew, it is Peter who gives the right answer. Uh, and he says to him that he is the son of the living God, uh, which then makes Jesus recognize Peter as the, the most important fellow. But no such, uh, uh, let's say, intellectually uh, clean formulation is present uh, here. But Thomas, who experiences what the nature of the Messiah is, says, how can you expect me to tell you in words what I experience of you? It cannot be done. Uh, my gnosis cannot be translated into words. And that is why Jesus takes him aside and tells him, well, now you are the one who, who has really uh, imbibed, and by imbibing has been so totally and so greatly affected by the, the bubbling spring, by the spring of the living waters that I have measured out. Um, and, uh, um, and then he whispers three words to him, which of course are not uh, uh, stated. What these are is we can only guess. But um, the likelihood is from the Gnostic context, that um, uh, Jesus uh, reminded Thomas that they were spiritually akin, that by way of his great insight, Thomas really became the same kind of a being as Jesus. That Thomas had such a high kind of gnosis that the two of them were almost like one. And that is the reason why Thomas is referred to in all the various scriptures as Thomas Didymus, which means Thomas the twin. That Elaine Pegas mentions this in, in, in her book on the Gnostic Gospels too, that it would probably be a mistake to assume that Thomas was the twin brother of Jesus physically, but that he was his spiritual twin. Um, and uh, when Thomas uh, comes back, he will, not, he will not tell the disciples because if I told you, they would get ang you would get angry at me. And there were a whole uh, uh, commotion that would occur here that would be totally counterproductive. You would, you would throw stones at me, the stones would catch on fire and get back at you and burn you up. And there would just be a, a, totally, uh, a totally terrible situation that arose. So what does, this, uh, what does this indicate? It indicates that this um, Messiah, according to the Gnostic tradition, uh, brought individual gnosis individual salvation to his disciples. He awakened within them an understanding that ultimately made them like unto himself. Uh, as he was a high aeonial being, because that was the Gnostic position. I mean, we have to be quite clear about this. You know, in uh, what might be called, uh, has been called liberal Christian circles, there's primarily people who had, uh, who had enough of uh, churchly dogma and orthodoxy and who tried to get away from it. Um, uh, you find it in Unitarianism and various uh, places nowadays. And increasingly, um, Jesus was always represented as, well, let's say, just a nice man. Jesus, Jesus the nice guy. You know? mm -hmm. Maybe one should write a book about that. And, uh, of course, it depends probably who... Uh, uh, who you would have asked at that time as to whether they would have said that he was a nice guy or not. Certainly I don't think the Pharisees would have offered that opinion because he called them all kinds of bad names. Uh, when you are called a generation of vipers in the white sepulchre, you're probably not going to call such a person a nice guy. Uh, but, um, you know, in, 
the, uh, to make the long story short, you know, there is a, a sort of a, a notion that he is a, a very, a very kindly, a very good, and a very wise human being who thereby became a teacher. And certainly, if one wants to believe that, one has the freedom to do so. Uh, but this was not the Gnostic position. The Gnostic position was that he was a celestial uh, being, a, a high aeonial uh, spirit, really something like a very great angel. If they said, well, he's the son of God, well, uh, what does that mean? It means an emanation from the ultimate divine. So really someone from a very high and holy source who knew a great deal more than any ordinary human being, who had a great deal more spiritual power than anyone else, really someone quite out of this world. But who, in order to be able to communicate with people, um, uh, certainly assumed an earthly garment. Even there, this, this rigid uh, uh, adhering to the idea of a freshly incarnation that so many of the, the Christian churches do, well, you know, you, they just uh, they absolutely had the same kind of body as, as you and I. And Martin Luther, who um, was, um, he comes right down to it, a sort of uh, coarse medieval German fellow. Uh, um, and if you, you read his, um, his the speeches that he gave, they were sort of table speaking, they were on um, like banquets, you know, when they were all drinking beer together, and Luther gave these talks. And, he really comes up with some very coarse analogies. And Do you think that uh, that uh, Jesus didn't mess his diapers when he was uh, when he was a baby, just like the rest of you? Uh, that really kind of turned me off about the Luther. I was never a Lutheran, but sort of uh, I would think that uh, he was a precursor of Sigmund Freud, uh, um, kind of um, concentrating so greatly on the, the ultimate mysteries of toilet training. <laughs> anyway, a Gnostic would have would have never said that, um, because the, the Gnostics and I think he quite correctly said, well. Yes, of course, um, uh, he came into a body, but, but was, it, was it quite the same kind of body that you and I have? Probably not. Why not? And look, Nath Hamadi's other scriptures, not the ones that I mentioned, but you know, quite a few others, uh, is full of statements where they, 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 the, the apostles, it's in the various scriptures that have to do with the apostles, the Apocrypha of James, and so forth. Um, Jesus walks through walls. Um, he walks on the water. He all of a sudden changes just into a great delight. Um, do ordinary people do that sort of thing? Uh, can ordinary people walk through walls? Well, I tried it a few times, but once I sustained an almost, almost totally demolished nose, um, which happens to people whose noses have some considerable prominence, uh, like my own, you know, and it sticks out quite a bit, so when you, you walk into a wall or into a door with some strength, that's what gets the first uh, impact. Um, so, um, the, once again, the important thing about this messianic figure to these people was, was not his physicality. Everybody has that, but something else. So it's a mysterious figure. It's a mystery figure. And this is really quite true of the early church in general, because uh, um, you find in the, the earliest representations of, of Jesus, you have him represented in the catacombs. I saw it myself um, years ago in, in, in Italy, in Rome. Uh, he's represented as, um, um, as the god Bacchus, uh, uh, holding the grapes and holding the cup in his, in his hands. Um, uh, he, you know, they're all just a, a strange, mysterious, uh, shape-shifting kind of an individual. Why? Because he's a spiritual power. Uh, and this, this desperate insistence on the physicality is, is again, from the point of view of these people, a great uh, misunderstanding. But just because he was a spiritual power, according to the Nachamani scriptures, he brought and he conveyed a tremendous spiritual power. And this spiritual power remained in the world, and is still in the world, because it was entrusted to his apostles, it was entrusted to others. He brought something, so the, the Nachamani scriptures say, he brought something into the world that wasn't there before. And so people, who, people can still profit from that. But once again, you say, ah, this is a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of miracle-mongering sort of magical idea of all these spiritual powers and, uh, and so forth that doesn't have any relevance. But you know, uh, you find the same very similar uh, concepts in other great spiritual traditions. Um, all you need to do is, and of course it's a lifetime project, to uh, study, uh, to subject, for instance, uh, Mahayana Buddhism, especially the Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism, to a good uh, study, and you will find an innumerable um, uh, concepts of this Gnostic nature present there. Because there also, for instance, the statement is made that when Buddha went into his ultimate nirvana, he left uh, a mystical presence of himself behind, uh, a kaya, uh, the nirvana kaya primarily. And, and this Buddha kaya, this, uh, uh, this spiritual power, this spiritual vesture that he wore, is still in the world and helps to uh, enlighten people. The Gnostic notion was very similar. They said that uh, he had that ascension day, which is you know, roughly 40 days after Easter. That's the symbolic time that Jesus spends after the resurrection with his disciples, which according to some Gnostic scriptures was probably several years, because that's when he reveals the secret teachings, is between the time of the resurrection and the, the, the ascension. So when he ascends, nevertheless, he leaves his mystical presence behind. And this mystical presence is something, it's like a reservoir of spiritual force that those who are attuned to his messianic mission can draw on and that they can utilize for the purpose of their own gnosis, their own uh, liberation ever after. So he, his presence is an ongoing spiritual presence, 
some uh, modern uh, kind of real Gnostic teachers, and they don't necessarily endorse their teachings, but they think they are interesting. Like the, like the lead Dr. Rudolf Steiner, for whom I would consider with respect. If nothing else, he was certainly one of the greatest geniuses of the, of the 20th century, a totally universal genius who, who um, uh, whatever, he, uh, whatever he turned his mind to, he, uh, he made a tremendous contribution to it, to everything from music to architecture to organic gardening to, uh, to, and, of course, to spiritual things. Uh, Steiner uh, felt that he... Um, uh, Managed to gain some spiritual information that the the, the very nature of the uh, of the earth, uh, so to, at its spiritual core, underwent a, a tremendous change at the time of uh, the presence of Jesus. And then the, ever after, the earth never never had the same kind of let's see the the, the power structure, the magnetic structure of the earth changed, uh, and thereby uh, certain opportunities arose for um, enlightenment, for liberation. The, the earth didn't quite have the hold. On, on the souls of people any more than it had before. In the, in the much, much earlier, in the Gnostic uh, book, Pisti Sophia, which is not part of the Nachamadi collection, but an earlier one, there a, a very interesting scene is described where Jesus um, changes the, um, the, the, the energies of the, of the planets and of the signs of the zodiac so that their, 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 their forces don't move in the same way in relationship to the earth as they did before, but they, they, while well, before they locked everything in so that no one could get out. Uh, to the higher worlds. Now there are certain openings that he has created by reversing some of these spiritual currents, uh, and that you know much of the salvific world consisted of this sort of thing. Well, you, once again, you might say these are all, all very interesting and perhaps somewhat speculative, and uh, the thing with such material is always that we can either prove it or disprove it. Uh, but um, what we can relate to, I think, is the overall concept, which I think is extremely important, and that is really the, um, the concept of liberation and salvation, which is both an individual and a transcendental uh, process. So that um, by way of um, um, raising uh, and allowing to be raised our own consciousness to a, a, a higher and a different level, by escaping the mundane imprisonment within which we generally find ourselves, we break through to the possibility of liberation, where we are able to meet the forces of liberation, the forces of enlightenment, which then, with or without planetary and zodiacal influences and so forth, can uh, take us to our own uh, spiritual uh, home. And this is, uh, let's see, this notion is uh, stated in various details, is, is documented in the Nachamadi scriptures. In the Gospel of Philip, for instance, it is stated that um, uh, Jesus brought with him a sort of a great transcosmic mystery, which uh, is called the, the mystery of the bright chamber. And the best that we can see from the, the Gospel of Philip is that the bright chamber means the, uh, the ultimate union um, of the human with the divine, and also of, let's say, the various polarities of the human with each other. So if you envision this like a, a cross, you might say that there is a, a horizontal bright chamber within which we ourselves, say the masculine and the feminine um, uh, portions within ourselves and other polarities that are at, uh, uh, at odds with each other in our present uh, psycho-spiritual condition, are reconciled and united. And then there is a vertical bar of the cross, which the now uh, reconstituted and, uh, and uh, unified human now can join the ultimate transcendence, the higher, and become one. And these spiritual marriages, as it were, uh, are the mystery of the bright chamber. The Gospel of Philip says at one particular point, if I can uh, quote it, I never was very good at quoting scripture, canonical or Gnostic verbatim, because I know that somehow goes against my grain to, to quote these things verbatim, but uh, uh, it says, the Lord did everything in a mystery, a baptism, uh, and the chrism, and the Eucharist, and the redemption, and the bright chamber. So here five mysteries are mentioned. Starts with baptism, the, the water, the chrism which became in the later church, the confirmation, the anointing, the, the, the anointing with oil, the baptism of fire, the Eucharist, which of course is the, the bread and the wine, his, uh, his living presence where he offers himself as, a, as the spiritual food for people, and then two of which we don't seem to know very much nowadays, the redemption and the bright chamber. Redemption, that also has various names, apolytosis is one of the Greek words and so forth, seems to be sort of the, the sacrament or the mystery when the bonds that tie the human to earthly manifestation are broken. This is where the human says consciously no to all of the attachments, to all of the, uh, the ways in which, uh, in which the, the world has its claws in us, shall we say. And this time all of this is, is broken, is severed, so that we are no longer dominated by this. Then after that comes the, the bright chamber. Um, I think that at least part of the bright chamber mystery, that, that horizontal part where the human is, is unified, is the kind of thing that the great modern Gnostic, at least I, I don't has, never hesitated calling him that, Carl Gustav Jung was aiming at with his archetypal psychology. He said that uh, the human needs to be unified. There has to be a unified uh, being. And of course, um, uh, when that takes place, then all kinds of other greater possibilities become a likelihood. But uh, before we undergo that, what Jung called the individuation process, uh, we are not one. 
And since we are not one, we cannot really relate to ultimate oneness. A, a human soul that is at war with itself, which is disunited, which is fragmented, um, cannot enter into the greater union with the divine. And in fact, I, I know of specific statements of Jung where he indicated that uh, his, uh, his uh, psychology of the individuation uh, was really regarded as a precondition for the human becoming greater and uniting with the divine. Ultimately, except he couldn't say that within a, a scientific psychological uh, context. But um, as I will probably indicate in my next uh, series here on Jung, uh, Jung definitely regarded the the Gnostics as the first depth psychologists. He said these were the only people, as far as he could tell, who um, had an insight into the human psyche that was similar to his own. And uh, he, he uh, never hesitated to, uh, to indicate that um, uh, these uh, people and their scriptures were the greatest inspiration for the development of his psychology. And it's very understandable because that's what they were aiming at. They, they were aiming at the reconstituting within the human being of a wholeness so that that wholeness in turn could relate to the greater wholeness, the totality, the fullness uh, of being, uh, which is our ultimate matrix. Uh, where we really belong and where our, which our consciousness is, is ultimately um, related to. In fact, um, in the Gospel according to Thomas, which is probably the easiest ones of these to, uh, to read, so if you don't have it already, um, uh, nice copies, nice translations of it around several, I would recommend uh, one that's uh, very easily obtainable is Marvin Mayer's uh, fine translation of Gospel according to Thomas. Uh, um, um, and it also has a lovely little uh, uh, essay at the end of it by uh, Harold Bloom, uh, the great religious critic, and uh, uh, I always call him our best born again Gnostics in, in America, because he's, he's become very friendly with this song. In the Gospel of uh, Thomas, you find the famous 22nd Rogion, where, um, where uh, Jesus says, um, on, until, unless, until you make the two into one, and then he goes through all the various polarities, the above and the below, the inner and the outer, the right and the left, uh, the light and the dark, the male and the female, into a single one, uh, so that the male will no longer be male, and the female will no longer be female. He specifically mentions this, this, this androgy, androgenation of a spiritual soul, and, and he says, then you will have, a, uh, you will make a, a, a hand in a place of a hand, and a foot in a place of a foot, and an eye in a place of an eye. Then will you enter the kingdom. Um, so there is a, a, a unification, a reconciling of the opposites that takes place, which, of course, is the, uh, the keynote of the spiritual discipline that developed later on, and that certainly was an outgrowth of, of Gnostic uh, practice in later periods, alchemy. Alchemy um, uh, aims at that. So we have various indications of these details, of these methods, as to how the work of salvation occurs. Um, um, and there are, there are many. Um, and they are certainly not just a simple-minded notion that you believe that there was a Savior, you believe that the Savior died for you, and thereby you are uh, saved. Uh, the Gnostic position was always that belief uh, is a poor substitute for knowing. Now, by knowing what we don't mean, and the definition of that keynote, we certainly don't mean uh, conceptual, intellectual knowledge, not data, not information. If you're looking for information, if you're looking for data, you're not going to find them in the natural body scripture or elsewhere. That's not the, uh, that is not the, uh, the purpose of these scriptures. Um, but rather, it is an uh, inducement to personal, transcendental, spiritual experience. The kind of experience that Thomas has when he says, I know who you are, I know what you are, but... This, this, uh, this language and this mouth of mine is inadequate to disclose that sort of thing. That is knowing. When you know, you know. You might not even be able to express what you know, but you know. And then you don't need to believe, because the, the knowing replaces belief, obviously. Certain beliefs are, are useful and necessary uh, on the way to knowing, but they can never be a substitute for knowing. And so I think that um, this little uh, circumambulating of the mystery that we have engaged in in our talks about the Nachamadi materials, which at best can only be introductory and only can kind of uh, whet your appetite, has perhaps been somewhat useful along those lines in terms of uh, indicating to us what the approach to uh, the mystery of being and to our own greater consciousness and liberation of these uh, fabulously interesting people long ago and far away has been, and perhaps how we may be stimulated to similar insights and to a similar liberation in our own consciousness thereafter. And if we were able to do a little bit along that line, then I'm very happy that we were able to do this together. So I hope that this has been of some value to you, and I thank you very much. Catalog number 100700. For more information about available lecture titles and for many other resources, visit gnosis.org. That's G-N-O-S-I-S dot O-R-G.